Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. In our top story, the Biden administration is working to force Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu out of office. According to a report in New York Magazine, Washington has become increasingly frustrated with the Israeli Prime Minister and his conservative coalition. The White House has reportedly enlisted the help of experts who can advise on what things the Biden administration can do to topple Israel's current government and oust Netanyahu. President Biden has said that he may appeal directly to the Israeli public regarding Netanyahu's handling of the war, and the White House has stepped up the pressure for Israel to declare a ceasefire, despite the grave threat the Iranian-backed terror group still poses to the Jewish state. President Biden has even threatened to make U.S. military aid to Israel conditional if it launches a ground invasion in the Hamas stronghold of Rafah. Netanyahu responded, saying that Israel cannot leave a quarter of Hamas's terror army in place and that unless Israel completely destroys the Iranian-backed terror group, the four remaining battalions in Rafah will rearm, rebuild, reconquer the Gaza Strip and commit October 7th-style atrocities over and over again. The Iranian-backed Hamas terror group is suffering major casualties in its war with Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, we are on a path to absolute victory. He confirmed that the fourth highest ranking Hamas commander was killed in a precision strike. Netanyahu said, we have already eliminated number four, and he added that numbers three, two, and one are next. Shortly afterwards, the IDF announced a targeted strike on Marwan Issa, number three in command of Hamas, who was one of the masterminds of the October 7th attack on the Jewish state. IDF spokesman Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari said Israel is still waiting for final confirmation that Issa was killed in the targeted bombing. He said we will continue to chase down the leaders of Hamas and everyone who was involved in the attacks on Israel. The Hezbollah terror group continues to fire barrages of rockets on northern Israel. The guerrilla army fired more than 100 Katusha rockets on the Jewish state in a single day last week. The IDF has carried out strikes deep inside of Lebanon, targeting Hezbollah and Iranian forces. It confirmed that it struck Hezbollah's aerial unit headquarters. The Iranian proxy army has launched explosive drones on the Golan Heights, as well as thousands of missiles, prompting the evacuation of tens of thousands of Israelis living in communities near the border. Dozens of civilians, IDF soldiers, and reservists have been killed by Hezbollah, since October 7th. The IDF is working to dismantle the United Nations Relief and Works Agency and to find an alternative organization to provide humanitarian assistance in Gaza. Israel has long accused UNRWA of rampant corruption and working to perpetuate the Palestinian refugee problem. Dozens of nations finally agreed to defund UNRWA after Israel proved that 14 of its employees took part in the October 7th genocide and that UNRWA facilities were used for terror activities. It also named more than 450 UNRWA employees with ties to Hamas. Israel insists on the establishment of a different organization because corruption, anti-Semitism, and ties to terror have infiltrated the ranks of UNRWA. Jerusalem is currently working with the UN World Food Program to provide supplies to Gazans while it searches for an alternative to the fundamentally flawed international organization. The Hamas-run Ministry of Health in Gaza has been greatly inflating the numbers of civilians killed in the war. Tablet Magazine has published a detailed report of Hamas's claims in an article entitled, How the Gaza Ministry of Health Fakes Casualty Numbers. Abraham Weiner, a professor of statistics of data science at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, wrote that the numbers are not real. He said the casualties are not overwhelmingly women and children, as Hamas claims, but the majority may be Hamas fighters. Weiner provides a detailed list of reasons why Hamas's numbers are inaccurate and likely falsified, including unnatural increases in casualties and the lack of correlation between the deaths of women and children. The radical Islamic Republic of Iran is working to assemble a warhead capable of carrying a nuclear payload. Officials with the International Atomic Energy Agency have confirmed that the rogue Shiite state already has enough fissile material for several nuclear weapons. 
Israel's Ynet News Service has reported that Iran has made great strides in assembling the atomic delivery package. The article cited high-ranking Israeli officials as confirming that Iran is using its proxy armies, Hamas in Gaza, the Houthis in Yemen, and Hezbollah in Lebanon, as a cover to advance their nuclear program. These experts confirmed that in the past week, Iran made great strides in its drive to go nuclear. Police and security forces remain on high alert during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, which is often marred by Arab violence sparked by incitement in the mosques. Islamic leaders use the high turnout holiday to inflame tensions by falsely accusing Israel of preventing Arabs from ascending the Temple Mount and claiming that Jews are attempting to pray there. Israeli police announced the arrest of more than 20 suspects for supporting terrorism and said that it will operate a special headquarters to investigate further incitement during Ramadan. More than 40,000 people came out to participate in the annual Jerusalem Marathon, which was held in support of the 134 hostages still held captive by Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Demonstrators on the sidelines of the event called for the immediate release of the hostages taken by Iranian-backed terrorists from Israel at gunpoint on October 7th. 15,000 security forces were on hand to protect the athletes, 1,800 of whom came from abroad to run along the picturesque walls of the old city of Jerusalem. The first humanitarian aid ship has sailed from a port in Cyprus to Gaza, carrying 200 tons of food and supplies. Israeli officials have confirmed that the World Central Kitchen has constructed a makeshift port off the coast of northern Gaza to deliver supplies during the war. Israeli, American and European Union inspectors will join Cypriot agents in inspecting the aid deliveries to ensure that they do not include weapons for Hamas. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant praised the initiative, saying that the ships will bring aid directly to the residents and thus contribute to the collapse of Hamas's rule in Gaza. Previous aid shipments have been hindered by the terror group's confiscation of supplies that were then transferred to Hamas terrorists. The leading candidate to become the prime minister of the Netherlands, Geert Wilders, has pledged his full support of Israel in its war against Hamas. His comments came during a meeting with Israeli President Isaac Herzog in Amsterdam. Wilders' Party for Freedom won 38 of the 150 seats in the House of Representatives last November. He's now in talks to form a coalition government that could be the most pro-Israel government in Holland's history. Wilders has been to Israel more than 40 times, and according to the Jewish News Syndicate, he also lived in Israel for two years in his youth and spent another year volunteering on a moshav in the Jordan Valley. The Israel Antiquities Authority has enlisted the help of the public in excavating archaeological sites before Arab looters raid them. The Palestinian Authority has embarked on a campaign to uproot Jewish history in the biblical heartland by robbing, pillaging, and destroying archaeological sites throughout Israel. Eli Esquizito, the director of the Israel Antiquities Authority, put out a call for Israelis to participate in a supervised excavation to help preserve archaeological sites endangered by antiquities theft. The 10-day excavation season began last week, and the IAA housed volunteers in desert camps near the excavation sites. An ancient coin bearing the name of a Jewish priest has been discovered in the Judean desert. The seal was dated to the first year of the Jewish revolt against the Romans and is marked with the year 132 of the Common Era. On one side, the coin depicts a date palm with the inscription Eliezer the Priest in ancient Hebrew. The other side shows clusters of grapes surrounded with Hebrew words memorializing one year of the redemption of Israel. The ancient coin was discovered among three other seals dated to the same period, which also hold the names of Jewish priests. These finds further prove the ancient Jewish connection to the land of Israel. More than 100 Jews and Christians gathered in Jerusalem for a gala dinner at the Friends of Zion Museum to celebrate the Israel Allies Foundation's annual Chairman's Conference. Member of Knesset Yuli Edelstein addressed the crowd of distinguished members of government from around the world, many of whom publicly pledged to move their country's embassy to Jerusalem. The following day, the Israel Allies Caucus chairman met with Gila Gamliel, Israel's Minister of Intelligence, where they presented a signed resolution denouncing Iran's war crimes in Israel through its proxy army Hamas in Gaza. 
The parliamentarians committed to advocating for Israel in international forums and for the release of hostages still held by the terror group. Josh Reinstein, the president of the Israel Allies Foundation, said our legislators are the backbone of the IAF's work. Their dedication and advocacy are instrumental in strengthening bonds with Israel worldwide, and we are grateful for their unwavering commitment to standing with Israel. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Ran Ishai. He's the director of JCAP. Ran, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Ran, tell our viewers a little about what is JCAP. JCAP is a... Think an Israeli think tank, um, um, concentrating mainly in Jerusalem. We think that Jerusalem is sensitive enough and not dealt with enough uh, from, a, I would say, professional and national point of view. So we are dealing with Jerusalem, uh, I would say, challenges and obstacles, and we're trying. To, we try to. Uh, we try to help the government to recommend the government how to overcome it. So when we think of the conflict, we think of Hamas in Gaza, we think of Hezbollah in the north, but you just blew the lid off a huge story that Hamas is actually operating in Jerusalem. Can you tell us about that? That's correct, yes. They do exactly the same as they did in Gaza and other places, as Muslim brothers do in other places, because Hamas is Muslim brothers. They do some... They, they, they do, um, uh, practice very naive activities, but it's, it's a cover for an under for a hidden activity which is inciting and persuading and even pushing these people then to terror activities but the the government of israel has declared war on hamas they said that they're dedicated to the eradication of all hamas right. why isn't the government shutting this down first of all it does it is doing it now even uh, as we speak but not enough and not because it not because we don't want to, but because it's very difficult. It's difficult in, uh, from in, in, in the aspect of intelligence, from getting the information. It's difficult. It's legally difficult because you have you got to have proofs. It's not circumstantial. It can't be circumstantial in this regard. It's not Gaza. It's Jerusalem, and they're Israeli, not citizens. But they 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 have what we call the the blue, the Israeli identity uh, uh, card. So what we try to do in JCAP is actually identify these spots, locate the information, collect it for the government, for the authorities, and then try to make the connection between this, so to speak, innocent activity and the underneath, whatever goes on underneath, which is illegal, and illegal money that, that finances all this. We all know that um, Hamas is a proxy army of Iran, but you've actually uncovered a lot of proof showing that funding is coming from Turkey, from Qatar, from other countries. Why aren't we hearing more about this? There is a, uh, an agreement between tu Turkey and Qatar. Qatar uh, finances the Turkish activity. Uh, Tur Turkey finances Hamas. They both actually finances, uh, finance Hamas. And uh, there, is a, there is a very... Um, significant cooperation, collaboration between Qatar, Turkey, and Hamas in Jerusalem in order to kick Jordan out, to kick the moderate, the, even the Palestinian Authority, so to speak, moderate out, and to make Islam the ruler of, of, of Jerusalem in terms of, uh, of uh, the Arab world and the Muslim world. It seems like we were caught off guard, not just by the October 7th attacks, but by all the revelations that are coming out, that UNRWA was run by Hamas, uh, that these countries are funneling in, in money. Are, are we, are we were just ignoring all this, or do we not know? Like, what, what's going on here? I wouldn't say ignoring, because, but, but there is something in what you ask, because we know that for years... There's nothing new about it. We knew it about UNRWA for 10, 20 years. There was a report, a UN report about UNRWA 20, uh, some 10 years ago. It's not new, and it's not new to us. But when I think maybe it's, uh, you know, what Thomas Jefferson said, I, I, I'd rather have a free, free media and, uh, without government than government without free media, something like this. So we are, we are a democracy, and we try to do whatever we can, and sometimes we make mistakes. So uh, we knew about it. In, about UNRWA, including in Jerusalem, by the way. They have five, six schools in Jerusalem and other activity in Jerusalem, which we have to, uh, I would say, to follow much more closely. And we knew it about Turkey and, Hamas and, and, and Qatar. 
we did what we did. Sometimes uh, there, were, there were some years that we kicked Turkey out of Jerusalem. Now we let it back. There are other interests. I'm not saying that I, I justify that, but I'm trying to, to, to uh, form the general picture. And this is a, partly an answer to, to your question, but we, we have to do more. You're a former ambassador and you know about diplomacy. And uh, what, was, what are the responses to some of our f- friendly countries, our neighboring countries, countries in Europe, when you expose that you know, these organizations that they're funding, that they're supporting, are really fronts for Hamas in Jerusalem? Well, unfortunately, some, sometimes something very big ha- has to occur in order for them to open their eyes. Because they knew everything. I'm meaning West. I mean Western countries in Europe and others. They knew everything about UNRWA. They knew it in the past. We passed this information, and they ignored it because it was not strong enough. Probably you get to have fifteen uh, hundred kills and uh, killed. I mean, uh, in order for them to open to, to open their eyes. That's that's the. They have. They also have their interests. Uh, it's. Uh, it was published that the Qatar bought universities all over the world. So uh, and and other and probably other institutions. You see, it's not that simple. Sometimes it it breaks not a red line; it breaks a, a black line that they have to respond. And so that that that's what they did now. But it's not that they didn't do no. Uh, they didn't know it in the past. They knew it, and we passed the information. But not all the time. Even we act. So how can we expect them to act when we refrain from acting? Ron, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Well, first of all, I'm saying to all Israeli um, supporters all over the world, keep your heads up. We're strong. We know what we're doing. We made a very big mistake on October on October 7th, but we overcame it. And now we're doing whatever is needed, not only for our sake, but for the world's sake. So be proud of us. Be proud of yourselves. And I believe that we are marching for a better future. Thank you, Ron, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. And now the truth from Zion. The world is focused on the Gaza Strip, where 136 Israelis are still being held hostage by Hamas. Reports indicate that out of those 136, at least 30 are dead bodies being callously held by the terror group to use as bargaining chips. During the on-again, off-again negotiations, the Palestinian terror organization has demanded a ceasefire in Israel's defensive war. The conflict erupted following the genocidal attack by thousands of bloodthirsty Hamas fighters who invaded sovereign Israeli territory on October 7th, committing the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. Ultimately, 1,200 people in Israel were murdered, 253 were taken hostage into Gaza. Women were violently raped, babies were beheaded, and families were burned alive. Afterwards, Palestinian civilians crossed the border, looting and destroying Jewish property. In November of 2023, Israel and Hamas agreed to a temporary ceasefire, which led to the release of more than 100 people being held captive. During the pause in fighting, Israel agreed to release three terrorists for every one kidnapped woman or child. We were willing to make a temporary ceasefire in the middle of a defensive war, just so that we could bring back some of our women and children. Following their release, many of the hostages said they had been beaten and held in inhumane conditions without needed medicine and barely any food. The negotiations were primarily conducted between representatives of Hamas and intermediaries from various countries, such as Egypt, Qatar, Israel, and the United States. These same nations are continuing their efforts to bring about another hostage swap. Hamas still holds Israeli hostages, including women and children, in desperate conditions. The fanatic Islamic organization has not permitted the International Red Cross to visit them or give them medication or any other necessities. This is strictly against international law. Many hostages need vital medications and their families are worried that their loved ones are being denied their life-saving drugs. The ceasefire provided a respite between November 24th and December 1st as hostages were freed. Now, as tensions rise once again, 
Calls for another round of negotiations echo throughout the region as family and friends urge government officials to bring their loved ones home. Among the 101 hostages believed to still be alive, 91 are Israeli citizens or hold dual citizenship, and at least eight are Thai nationals. Palestinian terrorists are also holding the bodies of at least 30 individuals. 18 of them were murdered by Hamas during the October 7th attack. Their bodies were taken to Gaza. The youngest hostage in captivity is Kafir Bibas, who celebrated his first birthday on January 18th. Among the hostages, at least 14 are women between the ages of 18 and 39, including five who were serving in the Israeli army when abducted. 85 men, many of whom were serving in the IDF during the October 7th attack, remain in captivity. Some men watched as their wives and children were released in late November, knowing full well that they themselves would be forced to remain behind. A number of men are in their 70s and 80s. 32 of the hostages were abducted during the Nova Musical Festival massacre by Hamas terrorists. Out of that group, only five were released during the November truce. The rest remain in terrorist hands. The most recent point of contention lies in the terms of another ceasefire, which has been under negotiation for months. However, the rejection of the guidelines by Hamas has made achieving a temporary pause incredibly challenging. A major sticking point in the negotiations is the terror group's demand for a full, permanent ceasefire and the release of an exorbitant number of Palestinian prisoners with blood on their hands which Israel has been hesitant to agree to. On one hand, Israel is determined to secure the release of its citizens, including vulnerable populations like older people and women and children who remain captive by Hamas. On the other hand, Hamas is using these hostages as leverage to negotiate its demands, which include the release of violent terrorists who will, in all likelihood, perpetrate more murderous attacks against Jews in the future. The IDF pushes ahead, determined to defeat Hamas and rescue the remaining hostages. Our thoughts are with the families, friends, and community members who await the return of their loved ones who remain in captivity, and with the families who have lost soldiers fighting the evil in Gaza. Up next, the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Two hundred forty thousand evacuees, not only here from uh, Kibbutz Be'eri, but from many other communities around the Gaza envelope, um, and also from the northern region that we're bordering to Lebanon. Those evacuees, they urgently need help. They have been dislocated from their houses. They have been dislocated from uh, their familial home ground here, with, from the schools, from the playgrounds of their children. And the Christian Embassy committed to stand with them in these difficult times. Since 1980, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem has been a voice of Christian support for Israel and connected the global church to the land of the Bible. Headquartered in Jerusalem, the ICEJ has taken action to stand with Israel by caring for Holocaust survivors, helping Jewish families return home to Israel, providing bomb shelters, fighting anti-Semitism around the world, and by inviting Christians to discover Israel for themselves. We are here in uh, Kibbutz Be'eri. A few months ago, this place here was considered one of the most paradisic, beautiful places in all of Israel. It was a, a place where young families from all over Israel decided to move here because it was such a, a peaceful, a quiet, beautiful area to live, especially as a young family. Since October 7, everything changed. Since October 7, this place became an empty spot. You see there is nobody living here in this area. It is a place of devastation. 240,000 people in Israel today are refugees, are to evacuees all across Israel. And the Christian Embassy is here on the ground in order to help those evacuees with all the daily need what they are needing. And please have a look what the Christian Embassy is carrying out right now in Israel. 
in these very difficult and painful times in Israel right now. Uh, we're so glad that God called ICJ to be especially here also for times like this, to be on the ground and to be your hands and feet, to stand with the people, to reach out to them, to be however we can in practical ways, a comfort to the people. What we need right now is food, food and food. We are today in the center of Israel and as you can see here behind me, we are packing food for evacuated families and this is an ongoing effort that we do with other Israeli companies. For me being here today in this uh, uh, storage room or in this uh, packing uh, room means really to stand side by side with the Jewish people, with the nation of Israel to help and to really be practical. Dear friends, in this time of crisis, when so many families are being evacuated from the south of Israel, and many of them are leaving with just the clothes on their back, there's a great need for food items and toiletries and clothing and toys for children and many other things. But if we are not able to get those items that are donated to the families, then we haven't accomplished our mission. When we were approached and asked to supply a second truck to make those deliveries, we knew right away that this was something that we could do to help. And I want to say thank you to all of our friends around the world for making it possible to meet this need and many others during this crisis. We ask you to prayerfully consider to support the work of the Christian Embassy as we are standing with those people who lost overnight their home and their being here in this beautiful neighborhood. God bless you as you do so. After Hamas brutally attacked Israel on October the 7th, 2023, the ICEJ has been actively standing with Israel and her people through advocacy and urgently needed aid projects. Now is the time for Christians to turn their love for Israel and the Jewish people into real action as never before. Your donation will help deliver bomb shelters to at-risk areas, provide necessary supplies for first responders, care for evacuees with food, shelter, clothing, and trauma care, and will eventually help rebuild these devastated communities. Visit icejusa.tv to donate online or call 1-800-910-6355 and give your generous gift today. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.